welcome to CRDF uh, event uh, today. It's an interesting uh, topic, and I think one of the major uh, drivers behind this uh, topic is what's going on around the world, in, in especially in Ukraine, and the uh, uh, population mobility hitting the uh, back doors of uh, Europe, and people becoming way more interested now in uh, addressing this issue at the uh, global level. So population health and mobility is an interesting uh, topic that CRDF has been engaged in through what's called by uh, border health. So border health is one of the disciplines that we actually uh, work with uh, within this uh, organization as CRDF at the global level, not only within the uh, what's called by the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. So I will introduce some uh, definitions, some policies and some best practices within the area of border health and population health and uh, mobility. So population health and mobility has a lot to do with what's called by uh, border health. And uh, again, this came after the uh, COVID uh, crisis and what have we witnessed in terms of population mobility, especially within developing countries and not being able to move and then having to move within some restrictions and some of the curfews that we have witnessed, especially in developing countries where uh, we had limited resources to uh, curb the uh, the uh, epidemiological curve of uh, COVID. So the term border health as it relates to population health and mobility is a, one of the public health uh, disciplines and it identifies the population mobility, deals with communicable disease spread associated with population uh, mobility. It is not at the point of entry. It's not uh, addressing the health within one specific point. It, it, it uh, spreads all over the continuum of travel for uh, travelers for for the population mobility. I don't want to say travelers now. Um, and with the aim of preventing the spread of uh, uh, diseases across the border. So border health or population mobility, uh, these two terms are not at one point, which is at the point of entry. entry it, it extends beyond uh, that. So when we say population uh, mobility, so we are referring to travelers who just normal travel within the same country or crossing actual uh, borders. We also refer to uh, what's called by internally displaced uh, person or people and uh, refugees. We also talk about mobile uh, population, and this is a population subgroup that we actually see a lot in, in, in developing countries where people just keep moving between uh, uh, seasons, uh, looking for jobs, looking for uh, opportunities. So uh, one more thing that's a major thing here for population mobility it's, is what's called by mass uh, gathering events for social, uh, religious uh, events, uh, uh, any event that has to do with people moving in between <clears throat> places from one place to uh, another, attending an event, uh, whatever uh, it is. And when we talk about uh, mass gathering, it's a collection of people in one spot or one place uh, without an actual uh, exact number of how many people are attending that place. It, it relates more to being able to be prepared for that uh, event. And again, uh, the coronavirus have learned, have given us more insight about the population uh, mobility and how to implement uh, interventions for population mobility and preventing, uh, preserving the health of people when they uh, are uh, on the move. And this is again border health preparedness and response capacities within the point of entry and also building on understanding how these uh, patterns of population mobility identify uh, risks for the, the the mobile populations and how to strengthen the uh, the surveillance system, the disease surveillance system, the data collection and utilization and using that for decision making and identifying potential uh, communicable disease threats for population uh, mobilities and enhance what's called by uh, public health communication and collaboration between countries, which is a critical point here, giving the pol political uh, continuous unrest between neighboring countries in terms of sharing uh, information and uh, sharing uh, data. So when we talk about uh, border health or population mobility, we are specifically talking about 
the ability to screen, detect, diagnose, screen, diagnose, and detect diseases when people actually are on the move and understand how the, the, the complexity of this dynamic movement of people can affect their health status in, in, in a name to build more interventions and guide future actions to preserve the health of the, the population and how the uh, information sharing between countries, information sharing between different authorities can affect the uh, improve the health of the uh, pop, uh, mobile uh, population and how can we design interventions in terms of, for example, surveillance activities for mobile uh, populations. So one of the main critical points in, in population mobility is when people crossing the borders, the border lines between countries is a critical area where there is a lot of tension, political tension, and you also need to have an, a neutral body, an NGO like the uh, WHO, uh, UN agencies, maybe CRDF, uh, who can build that connection between the countries and act as a third party to gather inform, uh, uh, information. Uh, information, not data, information regarding the potential uh, public health threats when people actually move in between uh, borders and gather it in a way that it's actually standardized to understand how population movement will uh, uh, introduce threats and uh, affect the health of the uh, population. So population mobility can have more than one uh, aspect. Could be uh, understanding the, the how the, the people uh, population movement through the full spectrum of, of, of uh, travel. It could apply to population subgroups like the IDB, internally dis displaced persons, all refugees. It could be applied to mass gathering, cross-border information uh, sharing, uh, applying uh, electronic surveillance system to collect data about uh, mobile population, identifying high risk, detect detecting uh, screening for uh, diseases, uh, providing uh, testing, isolation, quarantine, and then retest, uh, vaccination, uh, proof vaccination cards, all these uh, we have witnessed uh, after COVID-19. If you have traveled, then this is something that you have witnessed and you have a clear idea of all these uh, elements, the contact tracing, the random surveillance system that was uh, conducted, the uh, surveillance at the point of entry and the risk assessment. So before COVID, the whole travel and health wasn't part of the whole uh, scheme. Now we, when we travel, we think about how we used to travel during COVID. Uh, you needed to have a plan to test before at the airport. You need to uh, to be screened and tested again, and then at the uh, at the when you arrive, you need to test and screen, and then you get your results, and you probably wait a couple of hours and leave the airport, and then you have to have an address. People need to know if you have contacted anybody, if you have developed the, the uh, any signs and symptoms after that. So the whole thing is related to population health and uh, mobility. Okay, so uh, the, the, the concept here is working, is understanding how populations move and then working with different authorities. It's a more than one. Uh, it's like a cake. Each each partner has its his own his or her own uh, share. So we talk. We are talking uh, about involving the military, the uh, different authorities, the surveillance people, the health district, the point of entry. All of these people, uh, we can train and uh, have them more involved and engaged in activities related to. Uh, population mobility. So population mobility in the US, there uh, in the US and at the global level, there has been uh, geospatial analyses to understand how the diseases actually uh, spread. And this is something the CDC is actually uh, interested in. And it gives you more indication how complex and uh, dynamic this process uh, is and how these patterns uh, are actually a challenge for public health professionals to understand how people move, where they uh, have contact, where they came, came uh, at risk of uh, specific diseases with specific tools to understand this uh, population uh, health and mobility. So this is a, 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 a figure of um, at the left side, you can see MERS-CoV, the spread of MERS-CoV. So MERS-CoV is, coming from Saudi uh, Arabia and Qatar, from animals, camels, and they has affected the globe with the animal to animal transmission and animal to human, then human to human transmission. 
uh, hope the disease is still active in the, the region, but we still have, uh, we are able to actually detect some of the uh, uh, cases at the animal uh, side before spreading to uh, humans with the collaboration between different stakeholders at, at using the One Health approach to serve uh, good uh, deeds in population uh, mobility. At the right side, you can see how cases of COVID transferred between different airports, people traveling and then affecting uh, contact tracing and coming into contact with the cases and then how the disease could be uh, uh, transmitted through uh, contact with, with other people through population mobility. This is a, a diagram that was just presented uh, last month, uh, how an airport salon became a frontline for COVID uh, surveillance. It's a CDC project where they actually converted the nail salon during COVID that it stopped working and stopped uh, providing services. And then it switched between from a nail salon to uh, a COVID testing site to understand uh, how the uh, population mobility can uh, could be uh, reflected on the health status of uh, travelers and uh, mobile populations within the uh, at the airport uh, level and identify if you dig deeper into that identify the omicron cases and the different uh, variables it's interesting how we can now understand the genome sequencing and how these terms are really easy for us to understand it's just the variant understanding a variant of the disease before COVID-19, uh, sorry, the virus. Before COVID-19, we weren't able to understand the, the whole concept of gene sequencing and uh, genomic sequencing and all these uh, types of study. It's not my area actually of uh, study. Uh, this is something I just presented in, in uh, in, uh, in, a, in the conference in, in DC. And uh, at the top two pictures, we can see people going through uh, the mass gathering Hajj in Saudi Arabia. The left side picture has to do with during COVID where the population mobility was extremely restricted. I think it was only for people from within the uh, country. Imagine if there was one case of COVID-19 or MERS-CoV, if you look at the right side of the picture, you can see how people gather and do these mass gatherings. It's millions of people gathering, entering the country and performing their religious uh, activities at specific points in time for a uh, total duration of maybe 10, 15 days and then leaving the country and they come from all over the place. Again, another example is the uh, Expo Dubai Expo 2020 and how uh, the, the population mobility was properly handled and the cases of uh, COVID-19 was at uh, minimum. The Aladdin picture and the uh, FIFA Cup 2020 in, in, in the uh, both in Qatar and in, in Jordan and the Martians uh, movie. Uh, this is what we actually expect to see if you travel to the Middle East. This is what you actually think you will be uh, witnessing. But let's go back and remember that Jordan... Uh, the Middle East area has a significant number of refugees, like 30% of the population are refugees. And this is a borderline between Jordan and Syria, how refugees are coming, and it's a mobile population. You have no clue how what they were exposed to. The, the, the earthquake, for example, that happened in Turkey and Syria has affected uh, significantly the situation in terms of public health and increased the potential for uh, communicable diseases, you have uh, highly crowded population moving between uh, the borders and a destroyed, completely destroyed uh, public health infrastructure. Again, we are talking about Ukraine, if you can see the map as well. Uh, Ukraine is one area where there is a war, there is an, uh, a deficient public health uh, uh, system, and then people are moving into Europe and affecting the uh, the the. Uh, public uh, presenting new public health uh, threats. One of these uh, threats that we have witnessed in in uh, in Jordan, in Lebanon, and in Iraq was the cholera outbreak that happened before the earthquake in in uh, Syria and the lack of uh, information about this uh, specific uh, disease and uh, the way that we can handle cholera spread giving the population mobility. Cholera is different than COVID, it's more controlled, the risk is really uh, lower than COVID, but still it's a potential public health threat that could have spread all over the world. And we are presenting this uh, 
uh, topic today, we still have the uh, Sudan war breaking part and people are playing all over the place in, 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 in groups of refugees from Sudan to the six neighboring countries, including uh, Egypt. And hopefully will, this crisis will end soon. But again, it's an, an, an a threat to the public health infrastructure that will affect the population movement. This is a nice uh, map and we can see the population. So the size of the country reflects the population size. We can see India, Bangladesh and China, which has very, uh, there is a very well established public health infrastructure here, but still the, the, the potential for specific diseases, the spread of uh, diseases to the globe is also another uh, uh, threat. Uh, another example is the uh, the French uh, team having uh, been exposed to camels and probably they were believed to be uh, have some co uh, mars -CoV, uh, signs and symptoms that has affected the some of the team members uh, this was published in uh, february of 2023 20, uh, population mobility in terms of refugees is a, 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 a something it's it's difficult to uh, imagine and envision if you look at the right uh, picture this is in 2008 uh, an area in jordan that was normal there was nothing going on the middle picture shows you the a refugee camp that was built in 2011 and in 2013 we have an uh, a, 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 a refugee camp with 80,000 people who showed up through the uh, last three uh, through a uh, three year period or four four year period and you can see how the the whole infrastructure you have to build a complete new city for uh, refugees this would have never be done without the support of ngos and working those working with the ministry of, of health in jordan to provide this uh, shelter and safe haven for uh, refugees fleeing their country from uh, war so this is a syrian refugee camp uh, in Jordan, and uh, you can see 80,000 people showing up in uh, around four uh, years. This is a striking example of a, a population mobility. The uh, US CDC has implemented more uh, genomic sequencing uh, for travelers coming from uh, specific, arriving at specific uh, airports through what's called by travelers uh, medicine. Uh, disciplines and uh, these airports were able to sequence some of the COVID-19 uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, viruses and understand how the, the, the dynamics of this disease uh, through the, the airport. They were also able to do uh, this through the uh, testing in travelers, individual travelers, or testing even the uh, wastewater uh, at the uh, airports or airplanes and seeing how the potential threats for specific uh, viruses. We were talking about COVID, but this is how uh, the, the spread of diseases or spread of viruses between different countries can actually uh, be moved. And this is uh, an example of something that could be uh, implemented along with border health uh, activities in the, uh, the global uh, level. This is a picture of the, la the last slide. These are two pictures from the most recent activities in uh, Morocco that we are, uh, CRDF is implementing, uh, capacity building for Morocco uh, border health uh, team uh, addressing population uh, mobility and uh, working through how can we improve the mass gathering, uh, population mobility during uh, mass gathering. And another aspect, at the top right corner is me, myself, Julie, and Samer. We had we held a, a symposium in Jordan to have a, a better picture of the situation of uh, population mobility and border health in in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. I think this is my uh, presentation, and I'll be happy to have any uh, to entertain any question or any comment, any concern. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Khalid. I really appreciate the, the presentation. And um, I think one of the, the things that's been striking to me as you've been going through this is the extraordinarily varied nature of, um, of populations that are mobile and the resources they bring with them. Um, can you, uh, you know, in terms of like this evolving discipline of border health, 
Um, what do you see as, as the biggest gaps in terms of our understanding? What do we still need to, to build in terms of our understanding of the, the extraordinarily varied needs across these very different populations that share in common that they're moving across borders and, and carrying disease risks with them? I think one of the main gaps that we have witnessed in the uh, EMR region and talking to the CDC uh, who are implementing uh, this in multiple regions, the border health activities, is the actual lack of uh, data and the actual lack of information. And then you cannot create some evidence based on uh, local data because the surveillance systems uh, is kind of ignorant, ignorant to the uh, uh, population mobility and collecting data related to populations who are moving. And then, then you cannot identify potential risks, and then you cannot share the information uh, across the borders. But this is something that came up after COVID, and it was a, a, a complete shift into people understanding the need to actually implement more in terms of surveillance and data and information uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a, a question in the chat box, and I actually, um, I have an answer for one of those questions, if, but uh, turn to Khalid first, um, from uh, Justice Obara from Kenya. Um, he uh, mentioned he so sees frequent mass movement from South America and the Caribbean to the United States, and asked if there are associated health, human health concerns that have been reported, and I, I'm happy to follow up on, on one of those points. Um, in Kenya, um, Kenya also sees frequent mass movements from neighboring countries, and he asked about information on health concerns that have been documented. Um, and then similarly for North Africa to South and Western Europe, uh, what is your take? So Khaled, I'll, I'll give you, um, I'll turn this over to you, and then I'm, I'm happy to comment on the, the North America situation, um, which I, I have some familiarity with, if, if, uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah, so... Uh... It, this is a political uh, approach for this for border health because uh, uh, people tend not to focus on uh, illegal let's say illegal approach of migration illegal migration and uh, unofficial points of entry and official travel of uh, unofficial population mobility uh, there are um, also mobile populations that are undocumented in many countries in the AMR region. And this is something it's difficult to work with these uh, populations. But this is uh, an area where it becomes really political. And the focus here is, I think, IOM is more addressing this uh, uh, this gap and understanding, but I don't think there has been a lot of things conducted on 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 the the population mobility within this uh, specific uh, approach for migration purposes and for the uh, between the south and the north. I th uh, the North Africa is uh, we see a lot of people uh, unfortunately uh, dying from. Uh, uh, this illegal path of uh, migration, some support from NGOs, but I think this is an area that needs to be fully uh, addressed, and it's uh, it gets uh, political more than anything uh, else. Uh, Julie, thank you so much. And, and Justice made one more uh, comment on population health and mobility is dependent on economic and political stability, and I think that's absolutely true in every region. Um, there's always an incentive for migration from uh, regions that are unstable or where there is economic um, economic instability or just lack of economic opportunity to regions that are more stable. Um, and that's, I think that's true in the MENA region. It uh, drives tremendous workforce mobility. And, and that's true in North America, where we see tremendous, uh, again, uh, incentives for people to come to work from uh, South and Central America uh, for um, economic reasons, as well as for political and, and personal vulnerability reasons. In terms of the um, the mass movement from South America and Caribbean to the U.S. I think there have been concerns. Uh, there have been there have been events that involve the movement of disease across borders, which is incredibly politically sensitive to discuss because it is so easy to stigmatize um, uh, mobile populations, particularly where there's already an underlying um, political. Um, tenor to the conversation. But there's uh, two things I want to cite here. One is the impact on the a spread of disease and understanding cooperation mechanisms. And the second is um, in the Southern um, Hemisphere and in, in the Americas, uh, impact beyond the US. So one of the big challenges 
that is still ongoing has been with the collapse of uh, economic stability in Venezuela, for example. Um, this has been a, a, an enormous challenge. There was a, it, it prompted um, basically the, the collapse of the economy led to a breakdown in the health system in Venezuela and, and a complete lack of, of economic opportunity in a country that had previously had a very well-developed uh, middle class. And one of the consequences of that was um, mass migration through uh, Central America, especially through uh, uh, Panama and um, uh, and uh, the surrounding areas. And I, I think that I, I, we had a, a conference on this a couple of years ago for, with uh, support from um, DITRA and Southcom. But one of the, the big takeaways from that was that populations are moving, mobile populations moving through places also have health risks and health needs that require um, the countries of transit to uh, to mobilize incredible public health resources to look at vector-borne diseases. Many people were carrying diseases that are transmissible by mosquito, uh, the mosquitoes that were found in the, the transit countries. Um, and many of them were coming in in poor health condition to begin with because they were coming from an area with tremendous economic instability, which is also true in the MENA region that the, the people who are moving as refugees, either formal refugees or um, less formal refugees are uh, often not in good health status when they begin their trip. So they are even more susceptible to infectious diseases. Um, but in the, in the Americas, the tremendous movement, the mass migration of people from Venezuela through um, Central America has really created a crisis for the countries through which they're moving uh, to be able to provide um, health services and to detect and quickly respond to infectious disease outbreaks, which are often not exotic or emerging diseases, but highly epidemic prone diseases among populations that are moving. Um, in the US, um, the first cases of H1N1 influenza that were reported in 2009 were, were detected in border clinics um, in patients who had moved across uh, the Mexico-US border, um, which provided an alert to the emerging, uh, emerging what became a pandemic, um, but also pointed to one of the challenges, which was the spread of disease was first reported from Mexico, which led many countries across the world to take action to limit travel from Mexico, or to even take action against Mexican nationals in their own territories who had not traveled recently. Um, so there's always a political and a potential punitive component, which is very hard to deal with. So sorting out the risks posed by mobile populations is incredibly difficult because although we have the international health regulations that say that countries will take only evidence-based approaches, uh, people are, when people are threatened, decision makers take action that is often very focused on the risks posed by the other. Um, I'm sorry, Khaled, that was not a fast response on my part, but as you can tell, I'm rather passionate about this issue. Um, and, and I do think that there are studies that look, um, one of the places, Justice, that is really interesting to look at is um, studies that use traveler clinics or travel clinics um, to collect data on the spread of disease in mobile populations by looking at those who are arriving um, in, um, in destination countries um, in need of um, uh, uh, diagnosis or treatment for diseases that are not often found in those receiving countries. Sorry, Khaled, do you want to add anything or does anyone else want to chime into the conversation? Yeah, I wanted to add something about the economic uh, political uh, stability. So one of the things that we have seen with the Syrian refugees in, in Jordan is the early marriage for the girls. And it was a, uh, an asset for the family to secure some financial means. So a girl with who is like 16, 17 will get married to somebody. And then in two or three years, she'll be pregnant and there'll be a divorce. And these a lot of cases that are going on. So it, it again talks to the uh, comment about the uh, economic uh, instability that these uh, refugees are uh, seeing. And I think one of the other things is the fact that this problem now is moving from Jordan because the Syrian refugees are now being in resettlement programs in, in Europe and in, in the US. And a lot of the, the diseases that they have, uh, mental health probably, mental health issues, mental health problems, what they have witnessed, the exposure to trauma is being transferred into them. And it, it's something that people have witnessed even through the Palestinian refugees with the third generation Palestinian refugees 
is that they still have that. It's like something genetic marker that's affecting the way the exposure to trauma through their grand grandparents into the the the, uh, the generation. So this is something. Uh, uh, it's an open-ended uh, question and an impact and has a more a global uh, impact. So uh, this talks to the fact that mobile population is a global uh, problem and the, the health threats is uh, is widespread. It's not only communicable uh, diseases. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. And there's a, a question in the chat from, um, from Subhash. Um, uh, so... He has two questions. One is, do you think border health can elevate biosecurity risks? And I'm assuming we mean that in the sense of the proliferation of, of pathogens um, and uh, the response to them. And then the second is, uh, climate change may force mass migration. Is the global health community ready to deal with associated challenges? Very small Let's questions. See. Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, I think border health, uh, uh, so the definition, okay, so we started working with border health after uh, COVID, and one of the main things that we discovered is that there was no clear definition, and we still struggle with that uh, definition. And the thing is, you work with the CDC, they have specific definition, you work with WHO, they have another definition, another approach, but this is a part of the global uh, security which comes under the which comes underneath it comes the uh, global health so it's an it's an all it's all in one it's, it's all in one package so we hope that there will be more involvement of biosecurity and biosafety uh, related to population mobility now does it have to do with moving of goods and services uh, it does but the focus of border health in in in, in per se is more of communicable uh, diseases now, uh, climate change, again, the, the whole term of climate change is a new term. People are trying to understand and dig deeper to better define some of the terms. Is it affecting the global community? I think it is affecting the, 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 uh, the global community. Are we ready to deal with it? Uh, I think there could be uh, in the future more advanced approaches, but at this stage, people are more interested in understanding the actual impact of climate change on population mobility, population uh, health, and the even the 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 concept of mental health and pop the climate change, and how is that affecting the uh, human, the global health uh, in general. So I hope that answers your uh, questions, but I'm not even an expert in biosecurity or the climate change, but this is from a uh, population mobility point of uh, view. Thank you. I, I think just following up with that, and I would love to hear um, others um, uh, chime in, um, I, you know, I think for the issue of biosecurity, one of the things that we do worry about is is the proliferation of proliferation is totally the wrong word. Sorry, falling into the wrong language here. Is the increased emergence of infectious diseases requiring um, both a laboratory response and involving the risk that they could be spread to other vulnerable populations? Um, and, and I think for that, both in the animal health and the human health community, with with emerging climate change, one of the big questions is what technologies that drives and what lab capacities are required to respond to that that will end up requiring um, labs in areas that might have uneven infrastructure to develop the capacities to culture or isolate those um, pathogens that are being spread by mobile populations. So we're putting pressure on systems to be able to um, diagnose diseases. And then we're often creating those diagnostic capabilities in regions that are under-resourced for um, putting the safety and uh, security mechanisms in place that we um, that that should evolve in parallel with the diagnostic capabilities. So, again, I think it's a really complex question and one that um, that this team at CRDF Global is actually really um, well situated to have discussions across our our silos to think about what this means for the future. Um, Others in the group, we've got a lot of people here. I would love to hear uh, the thoughts of some of, uh, we have a, a lot of people who are very uh, uh, very experienced both in the region and um, and with these issues of mobile populations um, affected by infectious diseases that have implications for biosecurity. 
that will be exacerbated by climate change. Love to hear other observations if anyone would like to uh, to join this discussion. Justice. Uh, yeah, yeah. There is a question uh, that has been asked about uh, border health and biosecurity. Uh, I'm not an expert in biosecurity, but we've been doing a couple of events with the CRDF Global, and I feel uh, that uh, mass movement uh, can uh, create uh, a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, biosecurity. They can magnify the risk because people are going to be moving and we have those who are moving with good intentions and we have those that are moving with bad intentions. So they are going to get that gate pass maybe. Like just an opinion though. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think again, your point that we, this is a very multi-dimensional problem. Um, So um, again, for our participants here, and uh, I, I do teach um, undergraduates and have no problem calling on people. So I'm just warning you that that's a real risk. Um, but um, Khaled, to just follow up on some of the issues you've raised with the, the complexities of, of behavioral issues and socio-cultural issues combining with the health threats. Um, do you think that the concept of, again, border health, as this is a developing concept, that there's room for this much broader definition, like this, this, this cross-disciplinary definition, we're currently focused on this in a very global health security framework, which makes sense right now. That's where the pressure has been for pandemic response, but really looking in a, a more nuanced way at not just screening for disease, but understanding the sociocultural issues that contribute to health status, including mental health status, as we're looking at, at populations. Um, how can we start thinking about, first of all, how do we start thinking about the discipline of border health in a more disciplined way? And second, is there room there for um, looking at this broader set of issues that you've raised? I think uh, the, the issue here was the fact that refugees have been in Jordan, for example, in, 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 in Jordan for years. So from 2011 until today, and these things have been uh, rising and surfacing, and we've seen a lot of teenagers uh, with uh, like single mothers. This is one of the main aspects that we have witnessed. Have we, can we, did we predict that? I don't think this was something that was uh, predictable, but if you go, dig deeper into the behavioral aspect of it, the, the mentality of people were, they left their houses, they came from big families. And one of the thing was uh, securing an asset for the whole family by having this early uh, uh, marriage. Uh, can we, can we, uh, so the, let me ask the question, can, how can we reflect this on the Ukrainian uh, crisis, the behavioral aspects? I think one of the main things to think about is to uh, stop building refugee camps and having an integrated approach for refugees within the communities. Uh, in Jordan, we stopped at, at, at like 90% of Syrian refugee kids go to school with Jordanians. So that whole concept of segregating between this is a Syrian refugee and this is a Jordanian was uh, completely uh, ignored after like the second year. So the idea is to focus more on, on integrating the uh, refugees within the populations that they are in and having them into the what's called by the host uh, community and focusing at the host community as in Jordanians and Syrians. So this was one of the main things that we can think about in, in, in hopefully future uh, population mobility related to refugees and uh, IDPs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So security focused colleagues on this call or people who are focused more on biosecurity are the, uh, oh, actually, sorry, Mark has also posed a question and I'm gonna raise that, but I also want you to think for a moment while we're looking at this question about um, where, you know, how much of a consideration of border health as an aspect of population safety and security is, is being considered in your respective fields and areas. And while you think about what you want to pose there, um, I'm gonna turn to a question in the chat. 
Uh, within the, the Eastern Mediterranean region, what is the status of information sharing between public health agencies um, and, and what changes are needed for better information sharing? Um, Khaled, I, I think, uh, again, with a, a special, uh, I, I think it's one, one of the things we heard at the Regional Board of Health Symposium we sponsored was the challenges in cross-border information sharing on health issues. Yeah, I, I, even though this is a, a local, it seems like a local uh, problem, but uh, even in the U.S., the HIV people do not share data and information with the STD people, and they're still from the same health uh, department. The same thing is in the uh, MENA region, that whole concept of uh, uh, overprotection of the information. I'm not, we're not even talking about data. We're talking about information, just a couple of lines of potential risks, for example. This has to do with people do not like to share the uh, information. And one of the main striking uh, facts that we witnessed here is you actually need a, 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 a UN agency or a, a non-state actor to communicate between different ministries, uh, the Ministry of Environment, communicating with the Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Health for a One Health project. You need somebody from outside the three ministries to communicate and collaborate and have so, bring them all on the same uh, table. People tend not to like to share information within the same even agency this is one of the things that uh uh building what's called by uh health health system building blocks health information system the fact that people do not like to share their information not uh, and not to share their data uh, claiming its privacy issues and confidentiality but it's again a, because if I share you, with you my information, then you will be exposed to what things that I have been uh, doing and you identify some of the negative things and uh, weaknesses and uh, the, in, in my uh, information. So information sharing within the same agency, information sharing with between agencies is limited. And information sharing between different countries uh, crossing the border is one of the big issues that needs to be addressed. And I think the WHO is working on that. and. Uh, still a lot of area for improvement uh, for information uh, cross-border information uh, sharing especially when you have a uh, tension points between the neighboring countries uh, who do not even talk to each others and don't even have an open border between them thank you And I think just to tack on to that slightly, I everything 100% agree with everything you said. And I think the other thing we heard was um, even where there's a will to share information, there's often just technical challenges, like making systems that talk to each other and that figure out that that with the technical platform in place, which is not that hard, you can use WhatsApp if you really need to, but that's not great for inter, for diplomatic exchange. And then figuring out who gets access to and permission to share information is also its own challenge. Um, there are some cross-border, just for, for um, thought, there are some cross-border disease surveillance networks that have been pretty robust, but they've mostly depended on like province to province cross-border information sharing rather than um, national information sharing that goes from like the national level to the national level. It's really tough. Okay, colleagues who were not frightened away by my threatening to call on you. I'd uh, love to hear some of the thoughts about like how these cross-border health issues cross over into um, some of the, the health security or these the more traditional security issues that you're, you're looking at. So um, anyone wanna chime in on some thoughts about how this is relevant? or what we can learn from other areas. People are actively running away. Julie, I, I'll ask a, a question, if you will, or something that may tie in relation to this. And I'm I'm kind of, uh, uh, thank you so much for presenting. I, I enjoyed the conversation. And I'm wondering how this aligns with, with policy and how that, that impacts moving forward between multinational policies, um, kind of aligned with uh, Mark's, Mark's question uh, about um, how you see things changing um, how they're needed for better information, data, all of those things, because they they overlap, they're inner, they're um, they cross each other's paths. So yeah. Uh, you want me to take that or? Yeah, turning over to you. 
Yeah, so um, I think this whole area came uh, to the surface after COVID and people are now talking about evidence-based uh, approach and using data to make uh, better options and to make decisions and to uh, creating uh, policies now. Within the next five years, things can go back to the the the, the old uh, ages, or we can actually see a more active role of the data within the agencies uh, themselves, between agencies, and even uh, information crossing between different uh, agencies. But I think um, more non-state actors are interested in, interested in in connecting the dots between different countries and having more holistic approach to a more a regional uh, approach for data and, uh, and for information uh, sharing. So this is something to see, even that we now have the political will and the actual, we can understand the actual need for information sharing. So hopefully we'll, we'll uh, come to that question in uh, three, four years maybe, and we'll <laughs> have a better answer. I hope so for all of our sake. <laughs> Thank, thanks. Thanks so much for the question, um, Jerry. Sure, and um, hi everybody. And and I don't mean to be controversial by my question or, or comment, but I, I think in my own state right now in Texas and, and just south of the border in Mexico, I think we have some, I think, unique challenges with border health ourselves um, in our own country, in our own, in my my state here. And I don't know what, I, I, I don't, actually, I don't have enough information to really have a, a, a good informed question, but um, maybe maybe the question is, um, how how can some of the other issues we're dealing in, around the world with, how can we apply those in um, my own state here in Texas and, and our colleagues across the border in, in, in Mexico? Any thoughts on that? I think the problem in the U.S. with the borders is there isn't a borderline between the U.S. and Mexico, and crossing the border lines is... Uh, it's way more easier than in, in developing countries because developing countries, it's a very clear line between uh, countries and you have specific points of entry. I don't, uh, Nogales, I think it's just, you can walk to Mexico and come back to the US and the population mobility is more dynamic and more uh, active. And it's more political even in the US with people uh, having their families in the US and then they being uh, separated from their uh, children. So that border health is more uh, open to different kind of uh, diseases and uh, there could be a more political uh, engagement and uh, actively engaging the local authorities. I think Texas is one of the active, uh, Texas and uh, uh, Texas is one of the active uh, agencies working in border health. The, 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 public, the, the Department of Health in Texas is way engaged in in activities but these kind of change with the political with the political scene in the u.s yeah it's a it's a complicated picture isn't it yeah it's really complicated yeah julie yeah and i don't know why i raised my hand that i'm moderating but that's a, that was that was some sort of pathology um <laughs> the um <laughs> uh i think jerry one of the interesting things just to follow up is we heard um when uh, so CRDF Global hosted a panel that Khaled re uh, referenced at the Consortium of Universities in Global Health meeting just a, about a month ago in DC. And um, we were really struck by, uh, so our colleagues from CDC presented some of the innovative programs that they've developed and the tools they've developed, but we had a lot of people who participated in the panel as um, as audience members and, and discussants who were actually working in border regions in the United States, which gave a good opportunity to talk about some of those unique challenges. And I think one of the issues that was raised repeatedly was that um, the political environment in the US, building on what Carla just said, makes it difficult to talk uh, realistically about what kind of policies you need in the US health system to deal with people who are legal migrants um, and who are uh, uh, part of the, the migrant population that is, has, uh, has moved to the US temporarily or permanently, either for uh, employment or for uh, family reasons, but that we have a whole population in Texas that people were talking about in which because of politics, it makes it difficult to have a good policy conversation about what would be um, the 
public health interventions and the clinical programming look like to make sure that those, those populations are actually having preventive care, that they are, um, uh, that, that those particularly who might come in with lower health status, that that's recognized early and that there's um, focus on um, addressing issues, um, not so much from Mexico, but from other parts of the US, like, uh, like of people who are potentially carrying, say, Chagas disease, um, before they just enter into the economy and are on their own to find healthcare in the United States, public health interventions to basically improve their health status and to make, um, to adapt care models to address their complex needs as part of the, like, again, legal migrants to the U.S. as part of, of their health, uh, as part of the healthcare system. And one of the points that was raised repeatedly was, we talk a lot about cultural competence and introducing cultural competence into both public health and healthcare. And as some people pointed out, um, we often just mean, do you speak Spanish? We don't mean, do you actually understand like the health context in the subregion that people came from? So that you have an idea of what um, the endemic diseases are in that region, what they might carry in terms of, of uh, chronic or, or acute infectious diseases, and then what their, their long-term health status might be. So a lot of that conversation was about, um, from a public health standpoint, what can we do to have a, a more rational conversation in public health about building solid interventions without getting bogged down into the politics? And there was one other thing I want to raise, which is one of the most interesting talks at the beginning of the conference was about mass um, um, mass mobilization of Afghan refugees to Philadelphia and the impromptu coalition of local public health agencies, local emergency management agencies, the US Department of Defense and, um, and then the US Department of, of uh, Homeland Security and also CDC on behalf of Health and Human Services, although they, they seem to be a bit more of a passive player, uh, played in dealing with the complex health issues of people who had been mobilized on short notice, often with none of their medications, had been in transit for 72 or more hours with no treatment for you know diabetes, high blood pressure, other conditions that people had knew they had, plus the conditions they didn't know they had, with large families with often young children there who needed diverse kinds of care in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Um, and one of the adaptations that I thought was really interesting that they raised, and then I promise to stop talking, is that um, they, they started um, moving people, like whole families. If you needed pediatric care, they sent the whole family together to the clinic with a translator uh, because separating people at a time when they're already anxious so you can say your kids need a checkup and only one person can go with them was really incredibly dislocating but when you sent whole families together it was an opportunity to do public health awareness building interventions for um, essentially to better understand American health systems and understand what services are available and what they look like and it was a really thoughtful approach I'm happy to share the abstract it was really interesting well that sounds that sounds good yeah I'd like to see the abstract Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Colin, any closing thoughts? Uh, again, this is a global health uh, problem that uh, is surfacing again and again after COVID-19 uh, that we need to further focus on and go beyond the political uh, arena behind this. It's uh, Politics cannot destroy almost everything, and this is a political uh, area. It's in the U.S., it's in Jordan, it's everywhere. So population mobility and border health and all these uh, public health disciplines are global, and they affect our daily uh, lives and affect our families and our kids. So hopefully one day we'll uh, get rid of all of these. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Appreciate your, um, your being here, your participation. And um, we will be sending out some alerts for uh, next month's topic soon. So uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thank you to everyone who attended, particularly across time zones.